Hello. So I was wondering what I should talk about today, and I thought I would talk about something a little different. And I was looking over the other speakers today, uh, and I was uh, uh, struck by David McCulloch, Jr., who is uh, coming on later today, uh, with uh, his, I assume he will talk about his new book, which is coming out next month, called You're Not Special. Uh, it turns out that, uh, so I'll do an introduction for him, I suppose. Uh, it, it, it turns out that uh, he gave the commencement address at Wellesley High School in Massachusetts. Uh, and they, uh, that was the title of his commencement address. Pretty outrageous to say that at commencement. Uh, it was videoed and it was on YouTube. Uh, and it was a viral hit, which I think maybe accounts for a book coming out uh, with that title. But he pointed out things like, you think you're great, huh? You're valedictorian. And he said, well, there's 37,000 high schools in the United States, and uh, so there's 37,000 valedictorians. Uh, but the point was that he was making was that uh, maybe we have a habit of uh, praising people too much. It's related to the fact that um, maybe we give out too many A's. Uh, not everyone gets an A, but at least uh, at Yale, most people get an A or a B. Uh, so, um, but he said, you can't all be, you can't all be special. Uh, I, I was looking at the video and looking at the faces in the audience, and there were a number of students that you could see. And they didn't look taken aback at all. They, they looked like they were having a great time listening to this outrageous commencement address. Uh, so I assume that, uh, you know, maybe people don't believe all this flattery. Or sometimes they do, but uh, it seems to happen. It seems to be endemic. So I was reminded there was an, another book uh, 30 years ago, I don't know if any of you remember it, uh, called Shopping Mall High School. And it compared some of our high schools to shopping malls uh, in the sense that you know what the experience is like going to a shopping mall. <laughs> There's lots of stores all competing for your attention. And if you walk into any one of them and try something on, the salesperson will say, you look great, no matter what. <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> and he thought that's a little bit like what's happening in some, not all of our high schools, but a lot of our high schools. That is, that there isn't someone telling you, you don't look great. Uh, you have to fix this. Uh, and that maybe you shouldn't be shopping in this store. Uh, so that, that's the, uh, uh, but I, I was also, this is understandable, I suppose, reminded of my own book. <laughs> so uh, I'm writing a book now with George Akerlof, who's an economist that used to be at UC Berkeley and uh, is now at the International Monetary Fund in Washington. And we've written a book before called Animal Spirits about psychology and economics. Uh, but this one we've entitled Fishing for Fools. And we, I think we'll, that's the title we'll probably go with. It won't be out for another year. But our book, Fishing, is they're both spelled with PH. So fishing with a PH, you know that. That's a computer uh, strategy of, of uh, tricking you as the user of a computer. But... Um, we use it more generally as, as just any kind of deception that happens in the marketplace. Uh, increasingly computerized as computers become more of our lives. And what is a fool with a PH? P-H-O-O-L. That's someone who doesn't know that he or she is being fished. And the, uh, the idea is that a lot more of us are fools than know it. I, I think there's some sort of relationship between uh, McCulloch's book and my book, because uh, ours is maybe more general. It's not just in the high schools of the country that this happens. It's all over. There's all kinds of trickery. And it's kind of an economic equilibrium. Uh, Well-meaning people find it difficult not to fish, because you kind of have to do it if everyone else is doing it. And so that's, that's the problem. So now I, I just... Uh, uh, I, I'm kind of bookish, so I'm going to keep talking about books. But um, I'm thinking about this idea that uh, flattery pays, that it pays to uh, uh, give, 
give every student an A. I guess maybe it does if there are student evaluations and if you're a professor or a teacher and you'll get better evaluations. Uh, or maybe you won't have parents' complaints if you're a high school teacher or something like that. But I'm thinking about, is that, how true is that? And it reminded me of another remarkable book, which you probably haven't read, but I recommend it. It's Adam Smith's Theory of Moral Sentiments. That sounds forbidding, but it's a wonderful book. Adam Smith is best known for another book called The Wealth of Nations, which is often taken to be the first really serious economics theory book. Wealth of Nations was written in 1776, uh, and uh, it extols free markets. So if you just read that book, you might think that uh, Adam Smith is a believer in that everything goes right with free markets. But he didn't seem quite like that in the other book. So the theory of moral sentiments uh, talks about what really drives people. It's really a psychology book. And this reflects an interest of mine, behavioral economics, that psychology and economics are really one. And it goes all the way back to Adam Smith. So one of the things, he made many observations about people, but one of them is, I thought it was very interesting the way he put it, is that uh, people, first of all, people love praise, okay? If you work with children, you know, they, they light up when you praise them. Uh, but it's not just children, everyone. But then Adam Smith said, well, Mature adults, however, if, if they are mature, they will evolve into desiring not praise, but as he called it, praiseworthiness. Praiseworthiness is feeling in yourself that I am worthy of praise, even if nobody knows about me. So Adam Smith said, he, he was a professor in Scotland, and he said that I know a number of mathematicians and I've met them, and I realize that they're not famous. Well, mathematicians almost never become famous because the public can't understand what they do. So, but he said that it didn't seem to bother mathematicians at all, and that what happened is they, a small number of other mathematicians uh, understand them and appreciate them, and they internalize that. They want to be a good mathematician, and they don't need praise. Uh, so I think that's an interesting statement of what mature human behavior is like. Um, but I, I'm trying to, t this idea that we should be looking at praiseworthiness rather than praise has an even longer history. And uh, I, I have this habit of reading obscure things. So I've been recently reading uh, the works of an essayist from the second century by the name of Lucian of Samosota. I don't know how many of you have read Lucian, but he's fun to read. And uh, I've, I discovered in there, there's a couple of pages written by a woman. Now, this is hardly ever seen in ancient literature, but here's the story that Lucian tells. He wrote an essay called um, Icones in Greek, but uh, es translated. Oh, the translation I have is by Professor Austin Harmon of Yale University, a hundred years ago, <laughs> still good today. Uh, so, uh, so Lucian wrote an essay called um, Essays on Portraiture, and it's an art, you know, art critic essay. But in the midst of this essay, he also uh, talked about beauty, and he talked about a woman, a uh, famous woman of the day, and her name was Panthea of Smyrna. And he said uh, that she was his idea of perfect female beauty. She was the consort of the emperor. She was something like the Michelle Obama of her day, or the uh, uh, Peng Liu Yuan, that's the uh, first lady of China. Uh, adored by many people, but I think completely forgotten today. I, I looked her up on the web, and I didn't get a single hit. So I'm, re I'm rediscovering uh, Panthea of Smyrna. But what, what, what happened was Panthea was, uh, well, when she read, his essay was published, and they, there was a reading public then, and she read his essay and was shocked to see that he praised her so highly for her beauty. And so she had to write him a letter complaining. And in her letter, it's a couple of pages today, 
that he quotes word for word, she said, you know, your praise seems to me more like abuse than praise. And she doesn't want that kind of praise. Uh, now, I actually have a quote. For, I, I'm trying to resurrect what few, uh, it's almost like a feminist or something from, uh, from uh, around the year 160. So I've got another of her quotes. Uh, she's talking about people who are excessively impressed by the praise they get. So she says, they delight most of all in those painters who make the prettiest pictures of them. And there are some who even direct the artist to take away a little of the nose or paint the eyes blacker or give them any other characteristics that they covet. And then, in their blissful ignorance, they hang wreaths of flowers upon portraits of other people, not in the least of themselves. Uh, so, you know, I think that what she's saying here is that uh, is the same thing that Adam Smith was saying, that a mature adult uh, is motivated by praiseworthiness uh, and not, uh, and not uh, praise, per se. Uh, so uh, now the thing is that people really, uh, it, it's a very strong motivating force that people want to have this sense that I am a praiseworthy person. It's a sense of identity. My co-author, Akerlof, wrote a book with uh, Rachel Cranton a few years ago called Identity Economics. And he argues that what drives people more than anything else is that they should know that I am a good person. Doesn't mean I'm a famous person, but in some sense, I'm a good person. Uh, and. Uh, that's a, a very important driving factor. Uh, now, that reminds me, I'm an economist, and I haven't talked very much about econ economics, but I'm reminded of uh, another uh, work in economics. Do you remember Paul Krugman? Uh, he's well known as a New York Times columnist. Well, his first most famous work was what he called New Trade Theory. And he was arguing, what is it that accounts for the flows of international trade. And there was a theory then that trade sh should be between dissimilar countries. Countries that are similar have no reason to trade. I'll just buy the stuff that's at home. So you would probably, the theory would have suggested, you would like to trade with, if you're a rich country, you want to trade with a poor country. Uh, and, uh, and poor countries want to trade with rich countries. But Krugman pointed out that that's not what usually happens. It's usually rich countries trading with rich countries and poor countries trading with poor countries. Now, you might think that we would love to buy the artifacts and the beautiful art objects that are produced in some ethnically very different country. But that's not what we want to buy. We want them to make something that looks just like it was made here in America or in our own country, but make it cheap uh, so we can get more of it. Uh, that's because we don't have any... Um, any interest in uh, the other, you know, it's our own identity that's the focus of everything. Uh, so that's the theme of my book with Akerlof, and I think I've covered uh, everything here. Um, the, uh, the modern economy is very much built around targeting people's needs both real needs and imagined needs. So one way that we describe what we call fishing is selling people something that they think they need rather than what they really need. And that's the problem. And that, that's the problem that uh, McCulloch is addressing in his book. It's one aspect of the problem. So I'm thinking what we as educators can do to deal with these problems. And I think my book with George Akerlof is looking like it will be a little bit pessimistic, uh, that we need a free market economy, but a free market economy brings with it tons and tons of deception and mis misleading behavior, including flattery. Uh, and I think that the best we can do is to work to educate our children and our students to maintain, to, to, to do the best they can, uh, to maintain their sense of praiseworthiness. I tell my students 
for example, don't worry about your grade in my class. That I don't think that you should focus on that. You should focus on what you're learning. This sounds like a truism, but uh, uh, what isn't a truism, I think, is the ubiquity of these phenomena. You have to uh, wait a year and read my book. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.